Hello everyone. Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Barkis Ophthalmology Tutorials. Today we will discuss about herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So in this video, I will be covering about the herpes zoster virus in brief. What are the manifestations of herpes zoster infection like the cutaneous manifestation, systemic manifestation as well as the ocular manifestation. And in the herpes zoster ophthalmicus, how the eye is affected, like which are the various structures of the eye which are affected, how the cornea is affected, what are the investigations and how you treat this herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So without much delay, let's begin our video. So if you look at the herpes zoster virus, it can also be called as herpes virus 3. Morphologically, it is very much similar to the herpes simplex virus, but it is different both antigenically as well as clinically. So this usually causes chicken pox in children which later lead to the shingles or the herpes zoster. So what is the pathology here? So after the initial attack of the chicken pox, the virus travels in the retrograde manner to the dorsal root and the cranial nerve sensory ganglion where it remains dormant for so many years. After that once it may get reactivated if the person's immunity is decreased and then it leads to the disease called as herpes zoster disease. Okay. So this is the herpes zoster virus with a, with a glycoprotein spikes and the lipid envelope okay with a double stranded dna genome there is no sexual or the racial predilection for the zoster infection it is more common in the immunocompromised person so if there is shingles or the herpes zoster in less than 50 years of age group you should rule out the immunocompromised state of the patient so coming to the herpes zoster ophthalmicus it was first described by hutchison's in 1865 so as you know the fifth cranial nerve that is the trigeminal nerve has three branches that is ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch and the mandibular branch. In the ophthalmic branch, we have three branches again, the frontal, lacrimal and the nasociliary branches. So this herpes zoster virus usually affects the ophthalmic division in that it can affect frontal, lacrimal or the nasociliary nerves. So you can define this herpes zoster ophthalmicus as the acute infection of the gazerian ganglion of the fifth cranial nerve by herpes zoster virus. So 10% of the herpes zoster infections will have the ocular manifestation and it is more common in the immunocompromised patients as I told. There is something called as Hutchison's sign which says that the ocular involvement is frequent if the side or the tip of the nose presents the vesicles. That is because of the nasociliary nerve involvement. So this herpes zoster ophthalmicus can present in three phases. Acute phase infection, chronic phase infection as well as the relapsing phase infection. So in the acute phase infection again, the patient can have the systemic disease, the cutaneous involvement as well as the eye involvement. So systemic diseases means the patient will have the prodromal phase that is this precedes the appearance of the rash for 3 to 5 days and it is characterized by the tiredness, fever, malaise as well as the headache and other symptoms with which the patient can present is like superficial itching, there can be tingling sensation or even there can be burning sensation. And the prodromal phase in the older patients can be with a very severe pain with a larger area of involvement and the patients tend to develop the post herpetic neuralgia. It's about the systemic disease because of the herpes zoster infection. Now coming to the skin lesions that is venous lesions. Here the patient will develop painful erythema with the maculopapular rashes. Okay. And the pathology is like the painful erythema with the maculopapular rashes which are similar to the cellulitis or the contact dermatitis. Within 24 hours, it will lead to formation of the vesicles and within 2 to 4 days, these vesicles become confluent and lead to formation of what is known as pustules. And within 2 to 3 weeks, these pustules will lead to crest formation and they start drying. And these cutaneous lesions can involve one or more branches of the nerve. It can become even generalized. These lesions will usually heal with the residual skin destruction and the depigmented scars. And the person can transmit the infection till the lesion becomes crusted to the non-immune persons. So patients who are immunocompromised should not come in contact with the patients with the herpes zoster virus. So that was about the systemic manifestations as well as the cutaneous manifestation of the acute phase disease of the herpes zoster virus. Now moving on to the third part that is the ocular involvement of the acute phase. So these ocular lesions usually appear at the subsidence of the skin eruption. So once the skin lesion starts coming down, the ocular features start manifesting. So what is the mechanism of ocular involvement? It can be because of the direct viral invasion leading to keratitis or the conjunctivitis or it could be secondary to the inflammation and the occlusion of the vessels that is 
vasculitis which will lead to that is scleritis scleritis keratitis as well as the uveitis this second inflammation and the occlusion usually leads to inflammation and destruction of the peripheral nerves or the central ganglia or the altered signal processing in the cns which is responsible for the post herpetic neuralgia the third mechanism of the ocular involvement is by the reactivation where there is necrosis and the inflammation in the affected sensory ganglia which leads to the corneal anesthesia as well as the neurotrophic keratitis so this is how the herpes zoster virus can affect the eye so now moving on to the manifestations in the eye in the acute phase of the disease so here the patient can have conjunctivitis which can be associated with the lid margin vesicles the patient can have episcleritis which is usually seen during the onset and even the scleritis and the sclerokeratitis this is uncommon but may develop at the end of one week there can be anterior uveitis which can be like sectoral iris ischemia with atrophy even there can be granulomatous uveitis with a kps and the large hypopia and there are chances of the neurological involvement like the cranial nerve palsy third nerve palsy is more common in herpes zoster followed by the fourth and sixth cranial nerve but these usually recover within 6 months there can be even optic neuritis and so gb syndrome or even the encephalopathy patients may manifest even the contralateral hemiplegia which is usually mild and typically develops 2 months after the rash has erupted coming to the corneal manifestations here the patients can have the punctatipical keratitis pseudo dendrites anterior stromal infiltrates kerato uveitis and the serpiginous ulcer so coming to the punctate epithelial keratopathy of the herpes zoster virus usually it is associated with the conjunctivitis there is blotchy swelling of the epithelial cells this is coarse punctate epithelial keratopathy which is common in the periphery multiple they are raised and they stain with the rose bengal stain the next is the pseudo dendrite formation here the punctate epithelial keratitis can coagulate to form the pseudo dendrites these are broader more plaque like thing without central ulceration which is seen in the herpes simplex virus so in the herpes simplex virus dendrite there is central ulceration there is no central ulceration in the herpes zoster virus and herpes zoster virus is present in these lesions okay then the anterior stromal infiltrate here there is stromal reaction to the soluble viral antigen so there is hazy granular dry infiltrate just under the bowman's membrane okay that is anterior stromal infiltrates so next moving on to the kerato uveitis or the endothelitis it is because of the direct viral invasion to the endothelium so after several weeks of presentation there is sudden onset of the desmets folds in the corneal stroma along with the stromal edema as well as the epithelial edema there is even kps in the endothelium with the severe granulomatous reaction around the desmets membrane the next manifestation is with the serpiginous ulcer here there is corneal thinning because of the limbal vasculitis okay at the limbus there is vasculitis so there is corneal thinning which is secondary to the immune reaction so there is crescent shaped peripheral ulceration it can lead to the vascularization of the cornea there in the periphery or even the perforation of the cornea so these were the manifestations of the acute phase of the herpes zoster viral infection so in the acute phase we had the so in the acute phase we had the systemic manifestation the cutaneous manifestation and the ocular manifestation in the ocular manifestation again the conjunctivitis scleritis episcleritis all those followed by the corneal involvement which i explained just now so moving on to the chronic phase lesions here the patient can have the post herpetic neuralgia lid lesions which occur as a sequelae of scarring leading to the ptosis trichiasis entropion and even the notching there can be conjunctival lesions which leads to the chronic mucus secreting conjunctivitis there can be corneal lesions like the neuroparalytic and the exposure keratitis which i will be telling in detail in my next video there can be even mucus plaque keratitis okay so this mucus plaque keratitis usually develops in 5% of the cases between 3rd to 5th month of the disease and it is characterized by sudden development of elevated mucus plaques which stain with the rose bengal and this post herpetic neuralgia i will be telling in detail at the end the next phase is the relapsing phase of the disease here the disease recurs even after years of the primary infection which can manifest in the form of nummular keratitis or the mucus plaque keratitis or episcleritis scleritis and even the secondary glaucoma so those are the manifestations in the relapsing phase lesions so coming to the investigation modalities 
here we can do either the morphological testing or the serological testing or the viral isolation so in the morphological testing we have what is known as the zang technique so this can be asked as a mcq also here in the zang technique we see multinucleated giant epithelial cells which are seen in the material from base of the vesicle or you can do the pap smear also you can go for the viral antigen isolation lsa or the pcr can be done so these are the investigations but usually the diagnosis is based upon the clinical manifestation this is just for the sake of completion coming to the treatment of the herpes zoster virus the aim of the treatment is to prevent the severe ocular hazards of the herpes zoster virus and to promote the rapid healing of the skin lesions because if the lesion go into the crust formation then it will lead to severe trigeminal neuralgia so general treatment we have the acyclovir tablet that is oral acyclovir which is given in 800 mg dosage five times a day for 10 days and it is preferred to start this oral acyclovir within 72 hours of onset of the disease otherwise the patient will have the post herpetic neuralgia but even if it is delayed it's wise to start the acyclovir to prevent the ocular hazards of the virus next we have the famcyclovir and valcyclovir which are also given in the oral form so the famcyclovir is given has 500 mg tablet whereas the valcyclovir is given has 1000 mg tablet both are given three times a day for 7 to 10 days and if the patient is severely ill or immunocompromised then you can go for iv acyclovir which is given in the dosage of 5 to 10 mg per kg eight thoroughly for 8 to 10 days and this is supplemented and this is uh, and this acyclovir is given along with the topical antibiotic ointment or the drops with the warm compresses so what are the advantages of this oral acyclovir it speeds the resolution of the skin lesions thereby preventing further eruption of the skin lesion reduces the viral shedding decreases the incidence of the ocular manifestation and decreases the post herpetic neuralgia coming to the treatment of skin lesions as such here you should go for the cold compresses or the burrow solution what is burrow solution so what is this burrow solution this is nothing but a solution made up of water and aluminum acetate it relieves the itching and stinging sensation of the irritated and the inflamed area so you can also use the topical antibiotic ointment with a topical acyclovir treatment of the ocular lesions if the patient is in pek that is punctate epithelial keratitis or the dendritic ulcer form you can use the topical acyclovir along with topical steroids and the oral acyclovir can also be given they say that it reaches the tf film thereby leading to healing of these two lesions if the patient has the stromal keratitis in the form of disiform keratitis or the interstitial keratitis then go for topical steroids and in the treatment of the ocular lesion the surgical treatment options include the lateral torsorotomy you can go for the amniotic membrane transplantation or even the tissue adhesives with a bandage contact lens the final answer is the keratoplasty so as i told before the post herpetic neuralgia let's explain this in detail now so this can be defined as pain that persists after the skin rash has healed so it is seen in 75% of the patients over 70 years and the mechanism of post herpetic neuralgia is because of the inflammation and the occlusive vasculitis so there is inflammation and destruction of the peripheral nerves or the central ganglion leading to altered signal processing in the cns leading to the post herpetic neuralgia the pain which appears in this post herpetic neuralgia can be constant or the intermittent it is usually worse at the night there is something called as allodynia that is nothing but there is increase in pain by even the minor stimuli the touch or the eat and it improves slowly over time the treatment is quite challenging the topical cold compresses topical capsules in which we deplete the substance p thereby reducing the pain and local anesthetic in the form of lidocaine 5% cream can be used in the systemic treatment we have codeine amitriptyline carbamazepine levodopa and simetanin but there is no role of nsaid here so codeine can be used up to 240 mg daily amitriptyline can be started with 10 to 25 mg at night can be increased up to 75 mg carbamazepine can be used in the dosage of 400 mg daily levodopa 100 mg tds and even the simetanin can be used 
So hope this video on RP Zoster virus infection is useful to all of you. If you like my videos, please do subscribe to my channel. Press the bell icon for further notifications. Please do like and share my videos and leave your valuable comments. Thank you so much.